I'm Mark Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. Let's turn to Tom Schaefer. He happens to be the author of Two and the Collectors. Now, here is the problem. Two and the Collectors was written as a novel, but so many people that have read it have actually written to Tom and said, is this is this really a cover for a, a, a nonfiction for something that really happened to you? Or is this something given to you in a dream? So, Tom, thank, welcome to the show. And let me ask you this question. Why do so many people think your book was real? Hey, Dr. J, man. Good to talk to you. I am excited. I'll tell you what. I, I'm an Imagineer, okay? And if people tell me that they think it was a vision, I'm not going to argue with them. Maybe it was. I think what we're finding out in science and in what some people call pseudoscience, there's starting to become a bridge between the paranormal, what some people in academia dismiss as, ah, that's just, you know, it's a bunch of pseudoscience, you know, these guys are just yakking, they're just making stuff up. People are finding out that there are starting to, uh, the science is starting to admit that it doesn't know what it think it did, you know, it's kind of a crude way of saying it, but there's so much that we don't know. There's just so much that we don't know. So anyway, my book, it might be a vision. I don't know. I don't see it that way personally. But if other people are telling me that, who am I to argue? Maybe it is. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a vision, you know? I got something really interesting that just came through the hashtag DM Talk Twitter feed. And, and this is really cool because a lot of people talk about this, including Bob Lazar, uh, Nassim Harriman, who everybody will happen to hear in the next show with Art Bell, Midnight in the Desert. Or you can actually hear it on YouTube in the last interview I did with him on June 2nd. And this question, or should I say it's a comment, if you have the power to generate many black holes, you have the power to manipulate time. Einstein said so. And you know, what do you think about that statement? Because when Bob Lazar, in February, when he spoke at the International UFO Congress, he made it very clear that if we have the power to control gravity, things that are science fiction are literally thrown away and turned into science fact that day. We would then have the ability to create force fields, to alter uh, time space, therefore, you know, time travel. Exactly. Warm See, holes. there are people, this is the whole frustrating thing, is that we have a suspicion, people in the UFOlogy community, uh, scientists that are sympathetic to all of this, we have a suspicion that the government knows what's going on, that they've already known that they've, you know, you listen to Dr. Greer speak. He gave us, he gave a talk in uh, May, I believe it was, where he talked about knowing a man who already had all the formulas figured out for uh, anti-gravity, for teleportation, for a lot of these sciences, the big three, you know, anti-gravity, teleportation, and uh, alternative energy. This guy figured it out, and they sequestered him away, and this guy has been, you know, he's under lock and key, basically, by at the point of a gun. So there is this suspicion that our government or some government or some controlling entity has these secrets, that mankind figured them out on their own, and they've been corroborated by the fact that we've been getting these visitors from other places, either other places, other times, other dimensions, etc. So the logical mind says or says there's a certain amount of plausibility to these concepts. It doesn't seem that far-fetched to those of us that entertain science, that we enjoy science. I'm just a hack. I'm not a scientist. I'm an imagineer. And when I hear these concepts, like, wow, they just found this planet, Kepler-452, or wow, the possibilities of anti-gravity, or wow, they just figured out in a lab that they can create using high-powered lasers, the concepts of replication are on the dawn. We're in the primordial soup of all these concepts right now. And yet some of it may be sequestered away. The public domain is starting to see light of some of these things. And so we're in this rocks and sticks dawn. You know, we're like those apes that are kind of 
surrounding the monolith in 2001. That's where we're at. We're kind of like looking at these advanced concepts. We can't replicate them. We can't, you know, it's like the, uh, uh, you know, trying to give an iPhone to an ape. You know, he's never, there's no way he's yeah. going to be able to understand Actually, I'm it, so you glad know? you brought that up because Bob Lazar, when people asked him, I think it was George Knapp who asked him, have we been able to replicate or uh, back in exactly. reverse engineer this? Yeah. yeah, they reverse engineer the the uh, sports model, the alien craft that he was working on. He's he chuckled and said, "Heck no!" And that's equivalent to throwing an iPhone to a, a wagon train in the 1800s and saying, "Here, make us 500 of these." You know, and, right? And, so listen to this this idea then. So here you have now this new openness in our society. You know, this gentleman that was on before talking about his experience and you guys have got four hours yes. of discussion. Yes. I mean, we could sit around the we could sit around the campfire and listen to that stuff because there's a huge openness. We want to know. We want to go there. So my book is a playground for these concepts. And as much as it's science fiction, the you know, science fiction is the playground of what if and and part of the workaday world is to remove all of that your workaday world is to show up for work shut up do what you're told and get to work we don't have time for all that imagination you need to get to work and you need to produce science fiction is a time out science fiction is the is the playground of the mind it's time to play it's time to say well you know this kepler 452b wow what if we could go there that would be awesome uh, we can't go there. Well, we need transportation. So the mind begins to think, wow, if I just had some sort of transportation, well, if I just had life support systems, you know, we're very close. And if we had the propulsion systems or the and or the ability to jump space, we would be there in orbit right now. This idea of traveling at 23,000 miles and taking 10 years, 23,000 miles an hour and taking 10 years to get there is silly. And we're going to look back you know, if we survive, we'll look back 10 years from now. When somebody stumbles along in the next 10 years, the ability to use some technology for us to jump space and whether we fight, figure it out on our own through our own scratching and digging or if we are assisted, we will find a way to jump space. We will find a way to make it across space. And then it'll really be a matter of what can you take with you and how long will it last when you get there? And that's what my book describes. It describes uh, a secret space program that's been instituted by help from outside. Well, let me, let me ask you this question. And this is something that actually Story Musgrave, astronaut Story Musgrave, talked about in an exclusive interview we did with him, which sadly didn't make it to the airwaves here on Dark Matter. But you could hear it on my YouTube channel. And it was a one-on-one -on -one interview, actually two-on-one -on -one with my co-host, Johnny Webb, who was in London, but is now uh, happened to be in Indonesia for the next couple of months. And he was talking about the ethics of colonizing other planets. What happens if we go to another planet and we start terraforming it so us humans can move to it? But what if by terraforming it, we end up killing the life on it? Even if it happens to be microbes or or well, you're introducing a lot of you're introducing a lot of hypotheticals. Let's just work with what we know right now. For example, there's this whole concept of going to Mars and we're going to colonize Mars. Well, what are you going to bring in the NASA framework? What's going to happen within the NASA framework? Those people that go are all going to be within whatever framework they brought from Earth. Yes, I doubt and, there's going to be a new government. I doubt there's going to be any kind of a change. They're going to be living under similar conditions as to what we have here. It's just and survival. Don't forget, you know? worst part is is a lot of these people who have volunteered. There's no return mission. Once right. they go, they're going to stay. And so this is all within the rocks and sticks technology that we are experiencing right now. That some people laud as the greatest advances of mankind. It's not that great. We're barely scratching the surface and we're barely getting off this planet. And it's like you mentioned one time before, um, and we have nuclear weapons and we're running into space, exploding weapons into space. Um, there's, there's a lot of problems with mankind. There's a huge segment of mankind that's very advanced in its thinking. It's very high level in thinking. There's a huge segment, the kind of the, the, like the things that Dr. Greer talks about. There's a high level out there. There's a group of people with a higher consciousness out there. And yet we still have on this planet, we have greedy, 
uh, the, the greedy military industrial complex. We have the so-called what conspiracy theorists like to relate to the Illuminati and God only knows if any of that stuff's true. But there are controllers of this planet and there are, there are murderous religious ideologies that, like Bill Maher said, have like Islam is a religion of bad ideas. We have these con conflicting uh, societal segments on this planet. You don't have a unified planet. M reaching for the stars is a unified race. We have a pocket of people that get it, and then we have giant segments that don't, and then we have even more segments that don't care. And they're only out for what they can get in this lifetime, and they're more worried about paying their bills, and they don't even have any clue about a higher cosmic perspective. And so those are the things that, that we're struggling with. And uh, those are some of the things that I deal with in the book, uh, this concept of colonization. And the, the whole thing as I began to kind of unravel the onion on this is, I don't think we're going to be able to do it without help. Yes. I just, I just don't see it happening without help. Well, that's me. That's let, my let, opinion. Let, let's just let me throw a few things out there. First of all, I'm glad you brought up the military industrial complex. If everyone recalls when Eisenhower left the office of the presidency in 1961, handing it off to President Kennedy, who won the election in 1960, what did he say? Beware of the military industrial complex. Now, why would someone who was president of the United States, purportedly the, the most important or, or most powerful nation in the world, the world police, who was the supreme allied commander during World War II, who was credited for essentially... Take it from of, a general. Yes. Take it from the general. Yes, take exactly. it from the general, essentially winning the war by, you know, planning and launching the Normandy invasion, right? Why would he say such a thing when well, he was there's part also of this it? Lore too. Dr. J, there's also this lore, too, in ufology is that he was shown a holographic image of the crucifixion of Christ by ETs at Area 51. I don't know how much of that is true, but he's sitting there and you go, okay, maybe this guy did have an inside track on what's really going on in ufology. I don't know. But uh, take it from this guy. He understood at a higher level. And you think people want to think that people in the past didn't have insight. This guy had incredible insight and uh, it needs to be given credit. And uh, he talked about the cost of the military and what it could, what we could be buying in, at that time, in, in those dollars, what we could be buying versus, you know, spending the money on missiles and bombers, what we could buy, fixing our infrastructure. We have the capacity as a planet to solve world hunger. We have the capacity to solve every shelter problem. There's a lot of logic that we're all asked to excuse. Oh, don't don't buy into that. For example, you know, if you look at it from strictly kind of a logical standpoint. We have enough technology to house and clothe and feed everyone on this planet. But, but we we'll, don't. We spend it all on arms and warfare. Well, even that, even still, we could still feed, clothe, and house people. But we add a lot of what uh, some people would call, we add a story to this. We, we say that, well, some people deserve, some don't. You need to work for this. You need to be part of the slave industrial complex. So there, there, are, there are layers that are added to the simplicity of the logic is that mankind actually has the technology to feed and clothe every human on this planet at, with surplus. We have the technology, but we don't. So my book takes us away from this planet. My book takes us into a place where an advanced race becomes kind of the fatherly uh, uh, help, kind of like, okay, you folks have messed it up. We're going to show you a better way. Now, I know there's another story out there that's already happened, uh, The Childhood's End, which is coming out, I think, this fall. But uh, that story, the benevolent aliens in that story uh, actually wind up becoming not so benevolent. In my story, they stay benevolent. They really want to see humanity succeed. And so they've terraformed a planet and they've created a place for us to go to that launches us into other places. So the story is really the launch of a kind of a, a well, science fiction franchise. Let, let me say this to you. Linda Moulton Howe actually says that our planet was terraformed starting 270 million years ago. And it's quite possible. Why would it not be possible? Anything is possible. I'm learning right. every day that anything is possible. Well, Mur Murphy's Law, what can happen probably will happen. Stuff that scientists dig up now. There are archaeological discoveries 
of artifacts that don't make any sense, hammers and iron things and gold uh, things that don't make any sense. Uh, there's, there's, there's a hidden history to planet Earth that we're, we're only got a glimpse of. The pyramids that, that uh, could not be connected by normal technology or communication methods, and yet these pyramids throughout the planet have similar uh, sacred geometry to them. Okay, come on. Something's going on or has gone on in the past that we haven't been given history to. So my book says, okay, let's just take it for a ride. Let's just say these people came back. Let's say that they have good intentions and they want to help us move to the next level. That's what the book's all about. And uh, it's a it's a it's a playground for the exploration of these ideas. And what would we do when we get there? What kind of government would you have? Well, you're probably not going to need a whole lot of government. Let me say something really interesting to you. This actually came in from a the Twitter feed, and this is from Dan. Uh, it's, it goes by at Don Dan L, and it says Rocket Tech will not get you to another planet. It's all for great big propaganda fireworks. Simply exactly. can't carry the fuel. I exactly. believe that because, you know, if you think about it, what sort of mass would you be able to have to, to have the amount of energy to travel at the speed of light uh, or, or to use the sort of, you know, okay, let, let me ask you this question. This is always bugs me. Why are we using ancient technology to fly to the stars or the moon why well, we are have we a lot of giant giant right. fireworks we're burning chemicals this is so old i mean why right well then you have you have two tracks there are people that believe there are two tracks there's the public track using using uh mainstream academics and accepted uh, mainstream academics you know the the college track and the the nasa track Okay, and then there's the dark space program that nobody knows about, and they're already using uh, jumps, jumps, uh, jump rooms. They're already yeah. using all of these technologies. So we have two tracks. So yes, it seems absolutely silly to be using thousand-year-old Chinese rocket technology to go to the stars. That's just silly. So if they're spending trillions of dollars that they that they create on their own to go these places and these resources are allocated and people, there's already what some call breakaway civilizations where they've already gone and planted uh, human colonies for the sake of furthering the human race, blah, blah, blah. We don't know if any of this stuff is true, but it's good. It's, it's plausible. It's highly plausible that uh, these technologies are already being used. And I think the only way you could travel the giant reaches of space would be through some sort of, quote, jump technology. Or black hole. Jump. Exactly. Like, it's instantly like a, a black hole where a wormhole essentially was something that uh, bends I have a sense. Space. I have a sense that it's not really a black hole, but it's a jump, that it's a quantum jump. Because now we hear well, from well, the... Then let me ask you this. What is a... What's... See, I wouldn't know this, uh, this technology or, or this sort of science, but maybe you can answer this question. What would be the difference between a quantum jump and the ability to create a, a wormhole, which would essentially be bending the, you know, the fabric of space instead of, you know, having a straight line to point A and B, folding it together and just instantly tra traversing from one to the other? Here's what I think. And I, and I get the question. Here's what I think. I think that we think in terms of creating this giant, okay, he's going to create a giant portal and it's going to be this giant thing out there and then they're going to go through it. Me, I think that it's as, as advanced as these people are, these entities, these ETs, whoever they are, I think when they do it, for them, it's like we... It's, it's like electricity to us. It's very simple for us to generate electricity. For them... That moment is very simple. It's it's as simple as was ex as as an example as what we saw in that TV show, uh, Battlestar Galactica, the latest one. They made an announcement and said we're going to this point, and boom, we're getting ready to jump. You didn't see a lot of special effects; they just did it. And I think that's the level that the, that that whoever's doing that that's coming here. That's it's that simple. It's, it's really more of a, a, a light switch technology. It's not something where there's a big dramatic, get ready to go to hyperspace, get ready to open the portal, get ready to open the gate. I don't, I don't know. We don't see those in the sky. Maybe that one over Norway was something like that, but we don't see that. We see them showing up and uh, they just do it. So I think in the future or whatever we come up with, 
I think it's going to be very simple. Quantum mechanics is finally admitting that the that observe ob, observing the quantum er, these things in quantum mechanics actually disturbs them. So there's a lot we don't know that we're just now discovering that in five years all of the, everything we're saying right now is going to be deleted. It's just going to be silly. It's going to be silly to even admit that we that we said what we said. Uh, and that these races, what they are doing, coming here with the advanced technology they have, it's just, we just look like jungle tribesmen to them, and so, or less. And so I think we, like uh, uh, Mr. Friedman was saying before, is the arrogance of science to think that we know, we don't know, we're just stumbling into things right now, into the, this is a great age, we're just now breaking through. And if the technology has already been discovered and is sequestered away from us, and this other track is just, you know, the public track is just now being exposed to it, you know, is that by plan? Is that by accident or by design that now they're revealing some of these things? Like they can't hide all of those uh, space station UFO footage. They, they, it's getting more difficult to hide it all the time. I, I, I just don't see that they can hide it from us anymore, you know? That's right. And you're absolutely right that they can hide it for that much longer because the technology that we as civilians have access to is is at such is rising at such an exponential rate. You have to take that into account. And one thing I love, uh, and this is confirmed by people who work in military, especially in special special ops, uh, such as Navy SEALs or, or Delta Force. OK. The technology we have, if we're just using scales and I'm rounding up numbers, if what we have the best thing is, say, the latest iPhone, well, then what the normal soldier going into uh, the battlefield would have something that would be maybe five to ten years advanced, something much, much better. But then when you jump to something such as the Navy SEALs, then you're talking something that's maybe two decades in advance. I mean, uh, they were using, uh, at least I knew of a Navy SEAL, who doesn't believe in conspiracies, does not really participate in anything what we said, except to tell me that uh, this took years of me breaking him down to talk about his missions of uh, when he was a SEAL, that after he was a SEAL, he ended up being a mercenary and, and did two missions where he happened to contribute to bringing large shipments of cocaine to the United States funded by the CIA. How do you like that? Uh, but the point said... The point that I was trying to make was that he said that in that year when he served, 66 to 69, the technology we he had available to him as a Navy SEAL was much, much better than anything that our regular soldiers had even 20 years later. Well, that's the thing is that you hear this all the time in ufology is that the dark, the dark projects group has stuff that's 40 years ahead of us you know, 20 to 40 years ahead of everything you see in the public space, you know, and that's pure speculation. I don't know. And then maybe that's from witnesses that have seen it. I don't know. But, um, you know, in science fiction land, you know, we can, we can, we can break all the rules in science fiction, but, but science fiction is the great inspirer. It's it, like I said, it's the playground of inspiration. For example, the communicator in Star Trek is what ultimately led to cell phones. We we wanted that. We saw it. We saw them using it. We saw what they did with it, and it became something we all wanted. Before that, it was stuff like Forbidden Planet, and I just happened to watch Forbidden Planet again the other night. It was really kind of a fascinating uh, look at great science fiction in spite of the lack of um, – it was not cheesy. The special effects, you could tell, were done very well for that time frame. Um, they were using concepts that, that even though the film and the special effects of the time were not that great, the concepts were awesome. Well, and, let me actually read you a question. I think this is really interesting. This comes from Graviton Fish, uh, a listener, again, from uh, DM Talk, uh, the, the Twitter feed on the Dark Matter Digital Network dot com the the Twitter feed and again people in the tune dot com chat room can also submit their questions associate producer Danny Benton is out there uh, taking them and of course bringing them so by all means here's the question that comes to graviton fish how about isolating or in quotes pulling a craft off our brain in parentheses universe and traveling the bulk 
you know, five dimensions, five dimensional space. What do you think about that? Well, it may be that that's the future, is that we, we think in terms of space travel in spaceships. We want to get there with our physical bodies. But the future may actually involve going there in a different way. And what we talk about now is so antiquated as much as we might think of, you know, the steam, the, the smokestack era of the Industrial Revolution back in the 1800s looks as silly to us now. Uh, the concepts of space travel in the future may well be a more, uh, in a more cosmic way, if you will, a more um, non-physical way. It may be remote viewing. It may be uh, advanced uh, soul travel, you know, these, these things are, the, as the more we get open to what's really out there, the more we take away some of the walls that we've put up about concepts. Oh, that's not possible. Uh, th why this is how it all fits in this box. Well, maybe the box is very small and you need to kind of step outside the box, get outside that box and really enjoy the ride allow them imagination to, because it was given to us. Our imagination is part of the gifting of the human race. And whether it was given to us by gods or whether it was something evolved, I don't care. It comes with, it came with the kit. It's what you get. You have an imagination. And the more people that utilize their imagination, uh, the more things be, you take the imagination. Tesla dreamed of some of the things that he actually created. And so the imagination's huge. And so when I tell a story that has no basis in fact, but I'd explore concepts, or when we look at science fiction on television that's really well done, like uh, even, well, even bad science fiction or even mediocre, it doesn't matter. Anytime you explore science fiction concepts you're ex and you explore space and you explore uh, humanity's interaction with alien species, you're expanding the mind because then when it really happens, you've prepared your mind for how you might react. For example, uh, Star Trek uh, studied the whole concept of interacting with alien species and what it might be like. It explored technologies and that became utilitarian. Warp drive became very utilitarian to those people. They just like kick it into gear and go. We didn't talk about uh, whether it was possible or not. It was already possible in their world. We didn't talk about whether replication was possible or not. It's already possible. They just made tea and kept moving. So a lot of what we think is going to be an, oh, oh, wow, moment is going to become antiquated and deletable. It's going to, or it's going to become a non-moment for us in the future. And I think one of the liberating things in the future is going to be replication. Nobody's really talking about how replication is going to free humanity from the work uh, slave trap if it's allowed to progress. Replication will free humanity from uh, a lot, from the socioeconomic slave mills that we live in now. The liberation of replication is going to free humanity. And it's just not discussed. But we're looking at the dawn of replication through things like 3D printers. And now they're, they're actually talking about the ability to create matter using high-powered lasers. So replication is going to free humanity. And that's, it's going to change society drastically. People like Gene Roddenberry talked about it, but nobody really explored it. Nobody really looked in depth at how the first replicators were going to change society. If everybody has a replicator and everybody can create what they need, well, then why do I need to go to work? I agree, exactly. And, and that, I, I'm so glad you mentioned that we're still at the pick and shovel or rocks and stone age in that sense, because in, in terms of civilization, you know, a couple thousand years really is nothing. And really, our real civilization hasn't started since, I would really estimate, since the point of electricity. That's when we've had this giant evolution that's just been going up at an astronomical scale and an exponential scale. And I think if you continued on the path but did not destroy the earth, did not destroy ourselves, we really would be capable of so much more. Can you imagine what 1,000 years, 10,000 years, or a million years ahead of us would do considering if we stayed on the path but took away the killing and deaths. Now, Tom, I want to warn you, we got about 10 minutes left of the show, and I want to go with you with a couple minutes, then I want to talk to the listeners uh, with you 
about the show before we go. So by all means, answer that question and then say whatever you'd like to say before we... All right, you said a lot. What was the question? <laughs> well, I, I was talking about what do you think the possibilities would be if... If, or take this into account. If we've literally started our civilization at the time Edison implemented electricity or Tesla, you know, started using the AC current just basically uh, 150 years ago, that's what I really think is when our, our you know, civilization started to take off. There was Imagine a classic- us a thousand years, 10,000 years, or a million years minus the war and the killing right. and the 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 death of the planet. Isn't that a composite? Isn't society as a whole a composite kind of as our personal lives? How many times have we all been told, you know what, if you just stop self-sabotaging, you can move forward, you can go farther, and we all have to deal with that personally. And so we also have it on a grander scale of society self-sabotaging. You know, we have these murderous religious ideas going on. We have we have stifling concepts that that hold people back. We have a lot of you know, in the movie business, they talk about suspension of disbelief. We need you to just kind of go along with this sci-fi moment here. But let's talk about reality for a moment. We are asked to suspend logic in a huge part of our lives. And you're right, it cripples us. For example, there are things every day that people see that's like, well, why did they do that? Like I read an article about a guy, about some city, uh, some guy wrote a big front page, uh, he rented an ad to criticize a police department that wrote a ticket because he parked in backwards. And you think about stuff like that, and you think, wow, I thought we were advancing, but I see stuff like this and I see we're really not getting that far. There's a huge portion of our society that is self-sabotaging, that's, that, re- that is kind of like swimming down here in the bottom in the mud. And there are people like you and I and, and a lot of the folks in this community that see a greater, we see greater, we do imagine greater, just to take Sci-Fi Channel's uh, little phrase. We do imagine greater and we see a greater possibility and we look at silly stuff going on or murderous stuff going on on the planet, these wars and all this stupidity. It's just really, it's embarrassing. It really that- is. It really, really is. Tom, we, we have literally about seven minutes and I want to, yeah. I want to talk about the show. So I'm going to ask you uh, first, if you want to make any final statement. And then of course yeah. I want you to help talk about the show because you've become an integral part. Um, f- let's tell people where they can find your book because Obviously, it's created a lot of controversy where a lot of people have accused you of, you know, labeling it a novel when a lot of people say that's actually happening. Well, it's the spinning of science and science fiction, and uh, I'll let them have it. You know what? If it's a vision, I'll let them have it. But let me just give the book, the the location of the book. You can find it. It's called Two and the Collectors. T-U. T-U is the name of the planet. I created a planet. And I created a, a complete science fiction story around it about a group of people called the Collectors who are taking uh, – uh, is a pre-disclosure team that is bringing things from Earth to this planet, to this other planet, getting, re- getting this planet ready for the uh, migration of humanity to this planet. So things are already being done in behind the scenes. The roadies are getting everything in place. They are the Collectors. They're getting people ready to go to this planet. So it's two in the Collectors – Dot com. It's tu and the collectors dot com. You can go there. You can buy the book. It's on Amazon. And um, I just uh, encourage people to engage with me in the discussion and uh, to take the ride with me. I want to take you to this planet. Uh, there's a government. There's. It's not really a government. It's. There's really less government there. But I invite you to come with me on this journey of what if. What if we could go there? And what would it be like when we get there? What would it be like to have an organic planet that isn't polluted, that doesn't have GMOs? They don't do GMOs. It's all organic. And what would it be like to live in a home that is totally self-sustaining? Things like that. So those are the things that we discuss in the book, and uh, I invite people to come and take a look. I'm going to say one comment before we talk talk about the show in general. I, I thought someone made a really important comment, and actually... A guest, Richard Dolan, mentioned this uh, two years ago, and then, of course, I saw this happening. Uh, This comment, actually, let me go back and find this. This is from, where is it? Observer at PadPow, and this was, Replicators is about 3D printers. 3D printers are so fascinating as the first steps to that. I think they are extremely fascinating because 
all of a sudden, instead of creating a, a flat design or copying a, a picture or a piece of paper, you can create, you know, a, a, a model of something. Well, and, they've and got everything from from plastics to biologics. There are some some 3D printers now that are doing biological medical implants or, or medical replacements or organ replacements. This stuff is never ending. And this is the dawn. This is like when the Industrial Revolution first started and they started making giant, you know, Rube Goldberg type factories. So that stuff evolved into making microchips. We're at the dawn with 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 replication using 3D printers. And so it'll go from spinning spinning plastic layers, it'll go to uh, some sort of uh, energy that is transmitting um, actual uh, and creating actual particles from a catalog. So you'll actually literally replicate just like you see in science fiction. So we're, we're at the, uh, that primordial soup age right now. And to see into the future and imagine what that's going to be like, how will that impact society? How will replication impact society? All right now, you can buy a 3D printer, but a lot of people don't see the need for it because they can still go to Walmart. They can still go to you know the grocery store and buy the things they need. But if they could create everything they need in their own home, you won't need grocery stores and you won't need UPS. You won't need any of that. It will all occur in your own home. The only yes. thing you'll need is to buy the big things. And then you'll think, well, there's a big replicator down the road. We can go to the library and just create what we and need. And just create it. And, and yes. a lot of people actually talk about that. Now, Tom, I want to thank you so much for this interview. We definitely have to do this again. A beautiful planet, a jewel in the cosmos, a planet in trouble because of its most intelligent species, an intelligent race on the verge of self-extinction. Mankind, left to himself, has almost succeeded in self-extinction. Are we destined for a dystopian future? Or can we imagine a different outcome? What if we had help from an advanced race who is ready, willing, and able to help us advance to the next level in our evolution? Two and the Collectors, a novel by Tom Schaefer, available at Amazon.com.